Hi, Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway released a statement indicating that they were pursuing a different diversity policy, a different diversity corporate policy. And were not really interested in diversity per se, they were interested more in integrity. Let's talk about diversity programs in context, because a lot of what, a lot of the history behind the push for greater diversity, which I've supported and continue to continue to support, a lot of that push, because it's been mismanaged so badly, has resulted in not only the election of Donald Trump, but also just a, a backlash in general against progressives. And how you doing? So this all started in a sense back in 1978 with an affirmative action case in California called Back. B -A, I, I, might, I might be mispronouncing his name. Alan Back, B-A-K-K-E, versus uh, University of California, I believe, Re Regents in 1978. Back, and again, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing his name, was the perfect candidate to medical school. Uh, you couldn't find anyone better. Uh, you just if you wanted to find a perfect plaintiff, it would be him. Very similar, by the way, to Casey Martin, the golfer, who brought a landmark ADA case against the PGA. So you've got this person who clearly deserved admission into medical school, but was denied because 16, he believed, 16 out of the 100 slots were essentially part of a quota system to increase diversity. So 16 out of 100 would go to basically non-whites. And back, sued, went up to the Supreme Court and won admission. And the Supreme Court basically said that you can have the diversity, that is a legitimate governmental aim, but what you can't do is you can't have quotas. So despite the fact that back won, you can see how there would be right away that case point that the discussion, the fact that a government body, in this case, a public university, would discriminate against a perfect applicant in favor of the greater good. You can see how that would poison the well. That would poison the well in terms of discussion. Of discussion. It would poison the well in terms of community relations because the government was overreaching in a way that, did, quite frankly, on the surface, didn't make much sense in this case. The other issue growing up, and this is not an isolated incident, is, is again, the University of California system continued to pursue diversity. It ended up in a position where it, it started to reject more qualified, allegedly, more qualified academically more qualified Asian applicants in order to improve overall diversity on its campuses. So in other words, you would have a system where, say, you know, I mean, like I said, obviously the number is higher than 100, but you would have a system where at least more than a few Asian American applicants would be rejected, you know, in, in, because of this idea of more of better overall diversity that, it, that would include historically disadvantaged groups within the, United, within the United States. And so you had another untenable position where the government, government were, in the state of California was essentially pursuing diversity, not quotas, but the goal in a way that pitted minorities against other minorities. An untenable position that again, continued to poison the well. We go forward into Title IX. Title IX, which I believe was an unfunded gender equality mandate. Title IX was released in order to help bridge the gap in college sports between the way that women's programs and men's programs were being funded. And essentially get the women's programs, sports programs on the, on the same level. What actually happened was college lawyers and administrators decided to interpret the law in a way that would cut 
programs that didn't have an equivalent female, you know, didn't have equivalent female participation. In this case, back then, about 20, 30 years ago, back then that would be wrestling, freestyle, Olympic, obviously Greco, Roman. Those programs would be cut or were attempted to be cut. Not just Division I, I imagine, but smaller schools as well in order to comply with the mandate. I Again, I could be wrong. I don't know if Title IX applies to D2 and D3. It probably does because you're dealing with a federal government funded program, uh, either directly or indirectly through student loans. So once again, it was justifiably a massive backlash because the diversity goal was being interpreted in a way that would pit men against women and not really to increase, certainly not increase the diversity of choices or even of sports it's, itself on campus or nationwide. And then more recently, we had, a, we had the position of diversity officers, you know, chief diversity officer and so on and so forth, which most people understand is nothing more than a marketing gimmick. But these positions, if, it's, if they were on college campuses, were extremely lucrative. Taxpayers were paying probably six figures in many cases for essentially a marketing position so that you could put somebody on the, on the brochure that would claim diversity. And if anybody had a diversity complaint, they would go to this office, which in many cases was separate from the core of the, of the other administrative bodies. On my, on my law school campus, which is connected to the undergraduate campus, the closest thing to a diversity officer uh, was her office was a small office located in, an, in another building away from the main campus and away from the law school. Now, I'm not saying it was miles away, uh, but it was certainly, it was in, in the ethics center, by the way. It's just one office and as far as I know, one person that I dealt with. And so you, there was, this, there's again, this idea that especially government, especially college campuses, whether it's private or public, have pursued diversity in a way that not only pits people against each other, but actually, but actually doesn't further the goal of diversity. You know, nobody really benefits if you just have a marketer on campus that happens to be a, of a different skin color. Um, nobody really benefits from that. What you want is something else. We'll get to that. But you can see how if you have enough of these incidents that violate the sanctity of the, indi of the individual, eventually, not only, not only does the government lose credibility, but you have a backlash. And obviously the backlash has continued and when we're apparently nowhere closer to a solution, despite the fact that these debates have been waging in one form or another since 1978. 50 years, half a century, more. So you can see why in 2021 in the United States, why we're so divided, why the political structures are not really able to work together in a way that makes sense. And certainly societal cohesion has declined. And, they, and let's talk about all these other programs, but in context, first of all, no one thinks, if you really want to look at it in context, no one thinks that college admissions is solely a merit-based process. We know that we have the scandal of a college admissions fraud by including none other than a Disney, a former Disney actress who was on ABC, which was owned by Disney. Multiple actors in Hollywood essentially participated in what was and were convicted of and pled out to essentially college admissions fraud. So no one actually thinks that there isn't a separate track for the connected versus the unconnected. 
or the rich versus the non-rich in a way that doesn't prioritize merit. So this again, you can see how credibility is damaged on all sides. The other issue is that no one really thinks that school itself is particularly useful. I went to law school, out of in law school, only one of my classes was useful in any way. And it wasn't, it's not as if this is cheap, right? I, I, I was six figures and I paid six figures, you know, a low six figures to get a, basically a piece of paper that didn't teach me anything useful, except for this one class that was taught by Professor Jeff Kahn, K-A-H-N. Not a coincidence, his father was a tax professor, he became a tax professor. So you've got this institutional knowledge that was just remarkable. And it was the only useful class I took at my law school. Well, lo and behold, Khan was not actually hired on as a permanent professor uh, at that school. Again, see how subjective all this is, right? The only professor I had at that campus that was useful was, hired, was not hired full-time, permanently. And the other professor I had that was very good is no longer a professor anymore. He's a dean. So he's not really teaching anyone anymore. So that class wasn't particularly useful, but it was, it was definitely educational. It was constitutional law, a seminar. So we've got this other idea where no one really thinks that education in America is really useful in any way. In part because, you know, you've got this divide between the private sector and the public sector that doesn't really exist in other countries. You know, we, what we really, what other countries have, in some cases, is a private-public partnership where you, you can have, the, you know, the intellectual route, uh, which requires long-term investment. You can have a vocational track, but you can also have a situation where, at some point, you're taught practical skills. And I'm not saying that law schools or MBA programs don't have some sort of program that involves practical skill sets. It's just that it's not really a core part of the program. And so you've got a problem here because in, let's say, a state like California, about half the budget, uh, half of the operating budget by law goes to education. But in the state of California, by law, after Proposition 98, about 40%, well, 40% minimum, goes to K through 14 schools, essentially uh, kindergarten all the way up to community colleges. And what that does is because there's a minimum threshold, you know, it actually takes money away from universities and colleges and public, public universities and colleges because no matter what the revenues are for the state, no, no matter what the tax receipts are for the state of California, it still has to pay K through 14 40%. And you can imagine, you know, that 40% changes if the revenues, dramatically, if the revenues go down in a particular year, if capital gains, revenues don't come in as expected. And so the cost of college, college has gone up at the same time that people are questioning the utility of education, of higher education. But a lot of that has to do with just the fact that most school in America is pretty much useless. I'm trying to think here my middle school classes, almost totally useless. I had one good science teacher. Um, high school, I had actually excellent math, math and science teachers, uh, but only one useful teacher, an English teacher, just one. So just think about the, again, just let that sink in for a moment, moment right? Middle school was okay. I had a decent math teacher, um, I'm trying to think. But you know, it's, it's, you can count on one hand. Uh, the number of good teachers that I had in middle school and high school. And remember, these are massively funded. And so what's happened is there's a lack of accountability because no matter what, by law, in the state, the teachers unions take on 40, get 40% 40 of the budget. They could be failing every kid statewide that would still get 40% of the state budget. A teacher that's tenured could be failing year after year will still get a pension for the most part. Very difficult to remove underperforming teachers, which might be a good thing because again, you know, the quality of education, it's a two-way street, right? You're, you're depending on not, not just the quality of the teacher, but the quality of the students. So it is perhaps a good thing to be somewhat subjective 
which makes it, which, which explains why it is so difficult to remove an underperforming teacher. But again, that actually goes back to the fact that these institutions, these professions, whether it's teaching, medicine, law, business, the professions, right? So the idea is that the value that you're getting is not necessarily in the skill set, it's, it's in the integrity of the institution that allows you to pass on knowledge from generation to generation and improve upon those processes in order to make society better. So I don't think it's a coincidence that my the best professor I had in law school had a father that was in the same profession. And I don't think that's a coincidence. That's, in, that's institutional knowledge in effect on a family level. And the idea is how to, is that all these professions are supposed to get that same relationship between father and son, between the professional and the public on a mass scale. That's what professional education is supposed to do. It's not supposed to be a cartel. And so we want to dispense with this idea that diversity and merit are somehow not related or that we're dealing with a situation where diversity is undermining merit-based admissions. Because we know that's not the case. I had a situation where, to highlight the difficulty, I had a situation where I tried to read at you know, law school admissions essays, and, and I, was, I believe I was supposed to score them from one to five. And I was able to do that only for a few hours. I think I gave up fairly quickly because there was no way, number one, I was able to judge really just the weight of the situation in front of me. I wasn't able to see the person. I wasn't able to figure out what was going on. And quite frankly, after a certain point, you realize that a lot of these essays are not written by the applicants themselves, or if they are, they're heavily modified by a professional. So I wasn't really comfortable with the idea of being even a small part of an, of an, of an, of an advisory committee that was involved in the admissions process because it was all so subjective. If you're thinking, well, why not just to do interviews? Well, think about it. If you do interviews, you're also relying on even more subjectivity because it's no longer a blind admissions process where you don't know the person's last name and you're, dependent, you're depending on a local network of alumni to do those interviews for you. And so you don't really know the biases of your, of your alumni. Uh, and you, certainly because of the, of the segregation that is, a, that is a part of American life, it's, it's probably even more subjective than you, than you might expect. So the, the point is, there isn't really a perfect process. And, we've, and that's why it's always been imperfect and open to fudging the process. The idea behind all this is that has always been that these professions were not necessarily teaching practical skills, but were putting themselves in a position of building a network that would continue institutional knowledge that, that would improve society for everyone. That hasn't happened. So rather than focused on, number one, the funding relationship, which uh, between K-14 and colleges, rather than focused on a lack of practical teaching at all levels. We're focusing on diversity. That's become the touchstone because we've given up on institutional reform. And you can see why once you give up on fundamental substantive reform, you can see why things fall apart. You can see why people get upset, why government loses credibility, and why politics becomes more about division than addition. But it's not got, got nothing to do with meritocracy. It's got nothing to do with integrity. The reason you want diversity, by the way, affirmative action, by the way, some studies show that it, that it benefited white women more than racial minorities, which I suppose makes sense. If you have, if you agree that form, affirmative action is necessary within a segregated society, you're sort of admitting that, at least as of today or back then, that white men were running the show. And who do white men have access to? 
more than anyone else within a historically segregated society, it's white women. So they will promote, again, who they know. So that kind of has, has an intuitive appeal as to what's really what really happened in affirmative action with all those affirmative action programs, which also explains why we're still where we are, where we were back in 1978, in a sense, where you're still dealing with the same problems because nothing's been fixed. And in fact, things have gotten worse because now if you want to fix this, you've got to deal with a minimum funding guarantee that makes it harder to lower university, public college costs. You're just dealing with, with political groups that are now extremely powerful and because of their power can resist change. And you're also dealing with voters that in some states are now tied to the system as is, whether directly or, or indirectly. And when you think about diversity, right, you're trying to think about, you know, you have to think about it as part of an overall program. It's not just one thing that's going to fix anything that's going to fix the issue of racism and a lack of access and a tendency towards a homogenous situation, whether intellectually or otherwise. The college admissions process is just one small part of the whole system. If you look at Singapore, Singapore had a quota system. Uh, it was concerned that the dominant Chinese majority was getting too far ahead of the minority Malay population. And this had geopolitical political considerations as well because in Singapore is next door to Malaysia. It gained independence from Malaysia a while ago in the 1960s. And so it wasn't really in a position where it could discriminate against Malays because simply because of its location. It's not just next to Muslim majority Malaysia, it's also next to Muslim majority Indonesia. And so geography limits Singapore's ability to avoid issues of diversity. And L the founder of Singapore, LKY, recognized all that. So it wasn't just this quota program that aimed to uh, further integration. The structure of housing was designed so that you couldn't have racial segregation. There were minority quotas where each building, each housing block called an HDB flat. The term is flat, it's British colonization, so a lot of the terms are British. LKY, I believe, studied law in the UK. Um, so you've got a situation where you had a whole panoply, you had a whole, you know, sort of program, comprehensive program, that aimed to get rid of segregation first. And that had to do with housing policy, which then branched out into the jobs policy of quotas. In order, and, and this, and Singapore has so many advantages because it's a small country, right? So you can see right away if things are working. Uh, and if they're, if they're not working, as, as LKY said, you know, we're not a country that's founded on any, any ideology. You know, we're a practical, uh, you know, we're a practical country. If it works, keep doing it. If it doesn't, throw it out and try something else. And you can do that in a, in a country as small and rich as Singapore. But you can see how we're focusing on the wrong things. Rather than not trying to promote diversity in all forms, you know, we're focusing on this one little area. And, and by focusing on it out of context, we're dividing the country even farther apart and not making any progress. Other countries like Singapore can't afford to do that. And even Singapore, as sincere as it's been, is having, you know, was criticized by Malaysia's president, former president, Tun Mahathir, who basically alleged that, yeah, the Singaporeans over there, they've got a great country. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Um, but, you know, they're doing very well. But the average Malay in Malaysia is better off than the average Malay in Singapore. And that's a fairly serious charge because of the fact that, you know, per capita, Singapore is probably, I, I, I mean, it's just much more affluent and, than Malaysia. The only thing Singapore lacks is natural resources, especially water, which it gets from Malaysia under a, 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 a treaty or an agreement that was negotiated by the British way back when, I believe in the 1960s as well. And so, even when you have someone like LKY, political genius, 
who is sincere, you still have issues. So you have to really understand that what happens when you're not sincere about fixing these problems, you fall even farther behind. And there is a, an issue now as to whether these problems can be fixed. But if you put them all in context, you can see why there's been a backlash. Because rather than trying to fix these issues on a fundamental level, they've continued, continued the same problems of denigrating the individual and pitting minorities against each other for a few finite slots under essentially what is still a de facto quota system. In other words, when the Supreme Court said, hey, you see, you see regents, you can't have quotas. Well, what happened? I mean, I'm sure there's a way to come up with informal quotas, um, you know, targets. We just call, we don't call them quotas anymore. We call them targets, right? But since it's all subjective, and since it, education itself really needs to be fixed at the middle school, elementary, and college, and high school level, before we're able to even discuss meaningful reform at the college admissions level, we keep going in circles. And let me tell you, why is diversity important? Well, right now, I am probably more, I feel more of a kinship with Singapore, where I studied in, in, in 2000 or 2001, than I do with this country, the United States, where I'm a citizen. Because I'm dealing with a country that has done everything right. And I'm dealing with a country that has an honest police force and has an honest political structure. Even though it has essentially pledged to maintain a Chinese majority, ethnic Chinese majority, it's still in a position that is honorable. And in fact, the former prime minister, in I believe his last speech, public speech, said essentially that we're not going to leave any Singaporean behind. No Singaporean left behind. Talk about citizenship being useful and meaningful. You're not going to hear an American president say anything like that anytime soon. And when I'm here, right, the reason you want diversity is actually to maintain the credibility of the status quo. In other words, of the people in charge. So in the city of San Jose, in the state of California, we have a de facto one party system. Every political office is controlled by one party, the progress the so-called progressive party. Locally, police departments, I mean, court systems, in almost every case, mayor, city council, county, board of supervisors, in almost every case, the people at the very top attended private Catholic schools. So you've got one religion, one party. And if you have that sort of a system that is clearly not diverse, despite you know, the fact that you might have, say, an Asian attorney general, uh, and you know, Kamala Harris was in California as well, despite the fact that you have all these things, you know, again, <laughs> you have to look at the majority, right? The, the employees and so on and so forth. If you, if you have a system that's clearly not diverse, then number one, you drive out minorities like myself, um, who are not part of the, when I say minority, I mean people not part of the political structure, the dominant political structure. You drive them out. And number two, you just kind of lose your loyalty. So why am I here? Well, I'm here because I have a law license. So, and I'm, I'm in a state that has what's called an anti-slap law. And, and that, what that means, is it, make, it, it makes it easier for me to defend myself and any business I have on the basis of free, free speech to the extent that speech deals with a public interest issue. Not all states have that law. And I'm also here because you know, California is obviously a, an, an affluent. It's extremely segregated. It's got, I think, I believe 20% of the population is poor, I believe, but it's also a rich state. And so you've got access to a lot of innovation here, especially on the technological side. So, you know, the banking system here is okay and you know, so on and so forth. And, you know, because you've got power in numbers, if you want to make a lot of money, you really do have to be either Seattle or, you know, California on some level. Obviously, it's just like if you want to be in finance, you have to be in New York on some level as well. Show business, Los Angeles, and so on and so forth. And so there's not only power in numbers, but as technology has become more and more important to business, 
there's obviously a benefit in being in a state that has both technology and numbers. That doesn't mean that you can buy loyalty. And if you think about it, that's what the Democratic Party is starting to do now. It's trying to buy loyalty. It's given up on institutional reform. And all it's really doing at this point is attempting to buy out the population. And it's not going to work. Because you think about it, if you, if you don't have any credibility, nothing you do matters. If Singapore makes a mistake, people assume they're going to try to fix it. They're going to try something else. Nobody assumes that about California. The record is not kind to California politicians. And furthermore, once you lose credibility, as Warren Buffett once said, it's hard to get it back, right? It takes a lifetime to build credibility and a second to lose it. I believe that's something that Warren Buffett once said. So you've got a situation here in California that is untenable and unsustainable. And it's, a, it's something that's it's a cycle, a vicious cycle, because if someone like me, right, let's say I, the, the, the state loses someone like me to another country or another state, if it's in a position where it, it's lost credibility, the only people that will come in are the people that, were, that are more likely to have been brainwashed, uh, either by propaganda or just by a lack of common sense. And so you start to sort of self-select. Right? It's the same thing, it's the same reason why Berkshire should have never made that statement about diversity and its diversity policies. Because what's going to happen now is if somebody's got a choice between Nebraska and, say, Oklahoma, and they have a choice, well, why would they go to Nebraska? Why not go to Oklahoma? They've got a billionaire down there who owns a newspaper, I believe, a successful one, and the Oklahoma City Thunder. Well, Russell Westbrook keeps, on, keeps putting up triple doubles. <laughs> unlike any other, any other player in history, except for perhaps Magic Johnson. So you've got all these situations coming together where you start, where, you, where credibility matters because if you don't have it, you start to self-select for a less qualified population. And so suddenly Nebraska doesn't get the best immigrants domestically or internationally. It loses them to somebody else, to other states or other countries. And then it's got to come up with more programs, right, to try to fix those gaps. Suddenly, the educational system, even if it was doing well, starts to look like it's not doing well to the extent that you're not able to create enough domestic talent. So suddenly, you see why diversity matters, because it's really a tool in an overall toolkit that maintains the credibility of the establishment. And once that tool is lost, you can't get it back, you start to lose it, basically. Once you start to lose that, then everything else slowly starts to fall apart. Because if you're not able to have true diversity, or if you have to buy people off because you're not able to do fundamental reforms that would lead to true diversity, why would someone with options want to live in that kind of an environment? Why wouldn't you go to a place that has a history of favoring practical solutions. Why wouldn't that be the situation? And why wouldn't you start to get essentially less qualified people coming in that will then impact the infrastructure, not just educationally, but otherwise of the entire location? Why wouldn't that happen? Why wouldn't decline be inevitable? So when you talk about diversity, you're talking about credibility. If you don't have systems in place that show not just your all of your the, all of your residents that you can actually elevate your residents and their children into merit-based positions as much as possible through your educational system through your political system and through other government funded systems what's the point what's the point of even having a political structure and if the point is to have marketing if the point is to maintain the status quo at any cost, again, that's not a tenable situation. And I think especially places like California need to start looking at a full toolkit within context to try to fix the problems they have. Because they are now in a position that is obviously untenable and hopefully not yet unfixable.